Matt, you and I are going to discuss the offense, what the offense needs to do, because that's going to be, that was the problem that plagued them against Ohio State. That was the reason they lost that game, because the defense looked elite. But this is a different Michigan team, different from what Ohio State likes to do. They don't have a Marvin Harrison Jr., but that's besides the point. And then just other factors, that's what we'll finish up with that last minute thought. Uh, but out of the gate, starting with the offense, but just in general, how can Penn State beat this Michigan team? What is that one thing? Well, Zach, first off, thanks for having me on, as always. Yeah. Always love hopping on Locked On, Nittany Lions, my favorite Penn State podcast. Um, you. Yeah, I was thinking about that when you texted me and, and we we're kind of bouncing some ideas off each other. Honestly, I think probably the most effective way for Penn State to beat Michigan would be to come up with some sort of excuse to delay this game into a 7.30 kickoff, right? And, and obviously there's multiple ways that this can happen, right? Yeah. Penn State's been on the other end of this sort of delay. So what can we do, right? I mean, obviously the weather looks good, so you're probably not going to get a snow or rain delay. Mm -hmm. So maybe some sort of power outage, right? Without power, you can't run replay. You don't have any function in the stadium. Well, Harbaugh's been in those power outages right. before. See, this is certainly 0-1, Jim Harbaugh all time in a power outage. It happened to be in Super Bowl 47. So yeah, I think Penn State needs to take some measures to uh, knock the power out. And then all of a sudden around maybe five o'clock Eastern, it'll come back on. We'll get warmups going again. Everybody's going to be outside tailgating anyway. The fans won't have a problem with that. And, uh, yeah, you know, maybe provide some Domino's pizza to Michigan, you know, just in case they, they're hungry, they need a dinner or something like Penn State got that treatment on, a, on an opposing Big Ten uh, game back in 2017. Mm -hmm. But that, that's really my thing, right? If you can find a way to make this a uh, primetime game, Penn State might have a better shot. <laughs> I mean, don't you get – I mean, aren't you jazzed up for the stripe out game, Matt? I mean, this. I almost wish we could have done like an unofficial whiteout. Like, if we could have got something, uh, some petition going, just been like, listen, we know they're doing this for corporate reasons. Uh, I, I remember back in 2016 when we were still in school, mm -hmm. <laughs> James Franklin got in trouble for calling for a second whiteout against Iowa yeah. because your, your corporate sponsor <laughs> wasn't happy. But yeah, I mean, my section is white. Uh, oh, good. So I'll be rocking the official We Run the T shirt. Yep. <laughs> and um, I'm pumped up whether it's noon or 7.30. But that, that feeds into the narrative. It's all I'm hearing all week. Oh, if this was a whiteout. If this was a whiteout, Penn State was a lock. I don't know. Maybe James Franklin's right. Maybe his guys uh, would, would be better playing at noon. I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. So atmosphere is a big thing. Let's discuss that more in the final segment. The offense has been lackluster. Okay, that's great. You can put up a, a 50 bomb on Maryland. You can shut out. Now, the defense shut out the Iowa Hawkeyes, but Penn State still cruised to a 30 points. Did the same thing against Illinois, right? The, the offense has done enough to make Penn State a relevant top 10 team. However, that's not going to get you into the college football playoff. I'm looking at this game and I'm comparing and contrasting. Okay, Michigan's defense is right now analytically the best in the country. That, that's just the fact of the matter. They have guys everywhere. I think of the matchup between Will Johnson and Keandre Lambert-Smith that comes to mind. So I'm focusing in on two key players for Penn State's offense to be able to do something because all the score projections or at least the people who are trying to predict this game have Penn State at about 13 to 17 points. If Penn State is going to win, they are going to have, because I tried to do the, the math. Can they score 10? Yeah, I, I would like to think so. Can they score 20? That's when I'm like, okay, this is this is where it's a toss-up. And then I, but so looking at the offense, it's not about Drew Aller. Yes, Drew Aller's the quarterback and is supposed to take Penn State to the promised land here that Sean Clifford could never do. But the two players that I'm keying in on, since Keandre Lambert Smith is going to be manned up by Will Johnson, who is better from a talent standpoint. K KLS will win his battles, but Will Johnson is probably going to win more of them. I'm just being honest. So that means we're going back to Dante Cephas, who had two touchdowns. Drew Aller trusts him in the red zone, but Cephas is not a possession receiver, even though they used him that way. They got to use him over the top to stretch the field. He's a speedster. That's how he played at Kent State. 
And my second player, it's not a tight end, the offensive line. I'm going back to basics. It's Nicholas Singleton. Nicholas Singleton is your best athlete on offense. And for some reason, he just can't get it going. That's where it's on the coaches at this point, because I understand that maybe the vision's not there. Maybe it's a confidence issue because he hasn't broken that big play just yet offensively. We saw it in the kick return against Maryland. But Matt, I look at Singleton, just get him in space, have him motion, line him up as a wide receiver, and then decoy and bring him back into the formation, run some screen plays. He's your best athlete offensively, and I don't know why you can't get creative and motion him out and just do things to get him into space because that's where he's best. Not between the tackles, outside of the numbers. That's where he's best. Yeah, all great points, great analysis, and, and that's what we're here for. Um, when, when I was thinking about this one, and, and I can sit here and I can be, you know, armchair Mike Yersich all I want, mm -hmm. right? That's and I, I know, like I said, I know that's, that's why we're here and that's ultimately what people want to hear. And listen, all the fundamentals – in this game are going to be important, right? You got to start fast. You got to draw penalties against, I think Michigan's the least penalized team in the country. You got to run the ball, stop the run. You got to be probably around 50% on third down or better. You got to have ideas on third and short, on fourth and short. You got to have pass protection, all the fundamentals, right? But I'm just kind of lost when I'm talking about deeper analysis with this game compared to like a Maryland or an Indiana or Northwestern, because the facts are, if you are looking at this on paper, there is no advantage, right? If the, the model that I follow for, for most of my college football gambling, which has um, been pretty solid this year, yeah. you know, ha has Michigan more at about a seven and a half to an eight point favorite. Mm -hmm. Now, devil's advocate tells you overinflated due to competition. I think they've only yeah. played maybe one or two teams inside the top 100 of college mm -hmm. football, right? One of those being Rutgers, one of those being Minnesota. Maybe another one is it's kind of fringe Nebraska. Yeah. But a lot of teams that are kind of down in the 90s, 100, 110 range uh, in college football with even their non-conference schedule. So obviously those metrics are going to be a little overrated. Um, yeah. I think it starts for the Penn State offense, and I'll ask you, Zach, what yep. the game plan will be on fourth and short, because we will see it, and we'll see it a lot. And James Franklin made a comment in his press conference about being okay with punting, right, and having such a good defense that – and we've seen it a few times where actually a punt, it happened in the Ohio State game, turns in to your yardage, right, mm -hmm. uh, a ball – uh, Karam off the back and, and, and into Tyler Elson's hands that set Penn state up with mm -hmm. a short field in the Ohio state game. And we've seen it other times. It happened a few other times this year. So not being afraid to punt. I get that. I I'm just curious where you're at with the balance, because we saw Franklin last week. I love that they went to him on the sideline. He kind of pulled his headset off and said fourth and three. And he got the nod from analytics, right? And he decided to punt. Later on, there was a, a fourth and two. He decided to go. So it kind of tells you, depending on if, if, if he thinks they're in four down territory, two and inside, he feels comfortable, three and outside. Is that going to change against a Michigan defense? Do you feel comfortable on fourth and two? Uh, where do you need to be at in the field, right? Do you need to be between the 40s? Like, so I, I'm curious where you're at. Do, do you side with just situational football there, or do you want to be super aggressive Lane Kiffin style in this game, or, or are you okay with punting and score as the game goes on? I'm glad you made that point. I, I do not want to give Michigan short fields what, whatsoever because we'll talk about this with the offense, but with Michigan's offense. But going for it on your side of the field is not in Penn State's card. This is a field position battle. James Franklin has already admitted that he expects this game to be a low-scoring game. If you listen closely to his press conference, that it's going to come down to maybe four or five plays. And in that case, because I am anticipating a 20 to 17 type of score. So there's no reason for them to get aggressive at their own 40-yard line 
when they can punt the football and try to make Michigan drive the length of the field because uh, for what it's worth, Riley Thompson's been really good. He's been really good. I'm glad they got him out of the portal. Penn State needs to play field position. So no, I, even with the T, if you're at like outs, if you're at the Michigan, let's say 35, okay, it's supposed to be in the 40s. Maybe the wind will be blowing a little bit. Then in that case, if it's fourth and two, you can run the T formation because more often than not, it's been successful. I give it a try even against Michigan's front seven. But if you're going to say, well, at midfield, it's fourth and two, even fourth and one, like it has to be almost a centimeter for Penn State to take that kind of gamble because they need to sustain drives. If Penn State's defense wants to play elite in this game, they're, they're going to need to be able to be rested. Yeah, Hunter Norzad studying that Jason Kelsey film this week, right? We need the team. We need a lot of the team in the short yardage situation because yeah. there's just so many dynamic plays that you can make out of it. And I love that Franklin got some reps for even the second string T formation. I tweeted out yeah. late in that game against Maryland. Look at this. We, we even got the second string T in. Yeah. That's huge. I haven't seen that yet this season with some different personnel. Um, doesn't it seem like Khalil Dinkins is open on every route he runs, right? Like that could be a, a, an interesting wrinkle. Forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's looking for Dinkins out there. And I've seen it a couple times Yersich scheme him open and, and Aller just have to find him, right? Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Those short yardage situations will be important. Like I said, uh, I, I, you can't get worse than one for 16 on third mm -hmm. down like Penn State was against Ohio State. Last two games, I think against Indiana, they were a little below 50%, I think around seven for 18, which was not a good day offensively for the first 55 minutes of that game. And then if you look at the Maryland game, I believe they're right around 50%, um, which, which, which could be better. But I mean, obviously against Michigan's defense, I think I'd probably be okay if Penn State had um, let's say 15 cracks at third down, if they could get six or seven of those, uh, you know, that would be a winning formula. And you're right about Riley Thompson, man. He's got to step up and he, and he's looked good. You know, he's, he's, he's continuing good. this tradition of, of solid punting at Penn state. Alex Falcons has really been coming on. And he's a guy that you trust now if Penn state needs a kick to win this game. I mean, he's a guy who um, was overlooked at the beginning of the season was not even supposed to win this job. And uh, the cards fall his way, and all of a sudden he he takes a, a, a massive opportunity here. He was uh, perfect again last week, so yeah, I, I think um, you know with with kickoffs not being as important as they they once were in college football. I mean, obviously Nick Singleton had a big return. I hope they stay aggressive there, but I know we're talking a lot about special teams, and it's because they'll they'll be important. Um, it, it's a field position battle because neither offense is going to be able to get it going in, in this kind of game. 